Patricia is from the Department of Health here in Walpole. And in case they don't want me to do anything wrong, so we have a lot of guys here who are going to keep me in line, <laughs> so we don't do anything wrong. Thank you, gentlemen, for your service to our community. We really appreciate that. So I don't know how you want to start. I know we can talk just a little real quickly about what a brown bag program is. It's for people to bring in their medications and their supplements. Hi, Ms. Golden. To bring in our, their medications and their supplements so that we can talk about how we should take them and when we should take them. But the real gist and the real goal of a brown bag program is for peop to get people to know what their medications are, how they're supposed to take them, and to open communications with your doctor, your pharmacist, your nurses, your other healthcare professionals about what your medications are. So that's really what the goal is that we have here. Did you have any other <coughs> goals? Sure. Um, first, I show the public health nurse here in Walpole. Um, and I just want to talk a little bit, um, again, just going through the medications, you know, with any, if you have expired meds, you have just what to do with them. Um, so just through the health department, we'll offer sharks containers. Um, Walpole VNA on West Street will take them back. Um, just if there's ever any question about what to do with those medications, to always, you know, feel free to give us a call at the health department. There is a box at the Walpole Police Station. They'll only take pill form, um, but they do have a box there for a drug take back program. Um, so it's just really the s knowing the safety of how to dispose of medications, and especially getting some of those old expired ones out of your house, you know, the, any narcotics, anything like that, you just don't want it to fall in the wrong hands. So it's real important to just know how to be ahead of them and what you have and what we can kind of clear out for you. And the DEA also has on their website, if you go to DEA.gov, up on the, it used to be on the top right last time I looked, which was in the fall, it said got drugs and you type on that and you type in your zip code and it will tell you any places that are having a take back medication days that weekend or that day. So you can then go there and they can safely dispose of them. You used to be able to bring them to the pharmacies, but as of October of 2016, that was illegal because we had some really bad people who wore these white jackets in Colorado that um, were selling those drugs back. So we don't do that anymore. I would love to be able to safely dispose of them for you, but I'm not allowed to. So how do you want to start? We have anybody who wants to bring anything up? Hi, Marcia. Do we have anything? Anybody wants to bring anything up or questions? Sure. How long, how long do, do medications last? Every, medi every medication has an expiration date from the manufacturer that we get. Um, just so that you know, when it reaches, when a medication reaches its expiration date that's on that bottle, that stock bottle I have, it has to have 90% of its efficacy left due to the, the laws that are in there by the FDA. Um, drugs degrade in different ways, so something that's naturally derived probably would degrade quicker after that than something that was chemically made. But that being said, it wouldn't hurt you if you took it you shouldn't take it. Don't get me wrong. I don't want you to take it. It wouldn't hurt you if you took it, but it may not be as effective. So a lot of times if somebody takes something that's expired and it's not effective, they'll take something else. And that's an issue, adding to taking more medications, if you have another drug that might interact with that, if you have foods that interact with that. Um, there are certain medications you should take by themselves, and, and we can talk about that too if you want. There are, for instance, if you take uh, levothyroxine or, or generic synthroid, unithroid, or thyroid medication, you should take that all by itself first thing in the morning, a half an hour before any food or drink or any other medications. So for instance, we were, I was talking to the young lady up here about our Bubble X program where you get four weekly bubble programs that are in there. If you have a levothyroxine or a lenoxin, uh, levothyroxine or synthroid, we would <coughs> blister pack that all by itself in a 30-day counter because that should be taken all by itself first thing in the morning. Um, other things that is common sense for us, because I went through five years of school, is don't take two things together that do the opposite effect. For instance, you don't want to take a decongestant at 9 o'clock at night because it's going to, sure, open up, help you breathe better, but it's going to make you ramp up your energy level. So you don't really want to do that. You don't want to take something during the day for allergies that's going to make you really sleepy. My 
brilliant son when he worked with my brother in his landscaping business, and I say he's brilliant, he's got a PhD in molecular biophysics, was taking a Benadryl every half hour, thinking that he'd get rid of his allergy symptoms while he was doing the lawn, and he'd be falling asleep from one stop to the next. So you just, you just have to be careful about what you're taking and when you're taking. Yes, ma'am. And because I do take level five rounds, and that's the first pill I take in the morning. Good girl. How much time should I give because I have two other mm -hmm. At least a half an hour to 45 minutes. Normally, it takes our bodies, our stomach, and our small intestine to dissolve and absorb that drug within 35 to 45 minutes. So you want to separate everything, no food, no, no drink, and a little bit of water is fine. But you want to separate that in that time frame. Did you have anything to add for that? OK. As she said with the police um, drop-off box, you can't bring liquids. You can't bring syringes. You, can't br you can only bring tablets and capsules. OK. So that's, that's really, really important. They don't want any of that other stuff. Now, you can, if you have empty bottles that you want to recycle, we have a recycling program that does that. We take all your information off and, and destroy that in HIPAA-regulated destruction bins. So if you want to recycle those, you can bring those into our pharmacy at any time. It doesn't matter where you got them, and we'll recycle those because Big Y is very big into the community, and we want it to be. We've been around for 83 years. We want to be around for another 183 years, so we want to help the community grow and the planet grow. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. It should be by itself. You're, not only should your doctor have told you that, but wherever you got it, the guy that wears this coat should have told you that too. Um, you, you should keep it stored in a cool, dry place, uh, not your refrigerator. But you should keep it stored in a room temperature, you know, 70, 75 degrees. Um, and probably if you go to 65, it's OK, too. But yeah, you shouldn't put it in the sun. They are in amber bottles most of the time, which do protect against some of the UV rays. But yes, UV rays interact with the drugs. Um, and I think if you guys were here at the talk I did last summer, we did a talk called Sunshine of My Meds, which talks about how the UV rays interact with the drug in our skin and how it can cause a chemical sunburn from that. So you should keep them, and you should keep them high and up out of the way of children. Um, even if you don't have children, you probably should have the safety resistant part of the cap there. I know our caps you can flip around if you don't want it to be safety. Yes, ma'am. What tablets? For the flu. The Theraflu tablets that you buy over the counter from like the Tylenol brand? Or the from your doctor. Oh, the, oh, the Tamiflu. Tamiflu. No, Tamiflu does not have to be refrigerated. And actually, even the solution after you mix it up does not have to be refrigerated. Tamiflu and Azithromax suspensions are two of the anti-infectives that don't even need to be refrigerated. If you refrigerate the Zithromax for your grandchild, it'll turn into mud. It's very thick. So you don't want to put that in. It won't hurt it, but it's just very difficult to get the dose out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Azithromax and Tamiflu don't have to be refrigerated. Mm -hmm. And you can add, we can add flavors for children or adults who don't like to swallow pills to different types of medications, and only certain flavors based on what the, is in that, that reconstitutable powder. Yes, ma'am. No, I take some of this patent, mm -hmm. and uh, I was told that I shouldn't drink grapefruit juice. That's correct. Um, simvastatin is a statin cholesterol medication. Those medications should be taken after the biggest meal of the day. So normally you take them in the evening after dinner. Uh, and you shouldn't have grapefruit juice. Grapefruit juice it interacts with the cytochrome P450 enzyme system that breaks it down. So if you have a lot of grapefruit juice or grape juice, grapefruits, then you will have a higher buildup of the statin in your body. And that's where you can get into some of the side effects of the muscle aches, uh, rhabdomyosis, they're called, um, you know, and muscle cramping and muscle aches. If you get them minorly in your arms and legs, normally that's where it happens originally. You should stop the medication and tell your doctor because our heart is a muscle too. And if that gets fatigued, we can have issues. Thank you. 
So does anybody have any medications they want? Oh, yes, Marsha. Well, I just wanted to back up what you said about Synthroid and also mm -hmm. Antoprazole. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the time I took that and then the pantoprazole and then eight. And doing that has made such a huge difference. The pantoprazole is actually doing what it's supposed to do now. I know we had an issue with that. We sat and talked for a while about that. So I'm, I'm glad that that helped you. Hey, I did something right. <laughs> I like when I do things right. So that works. Gentlemen, did you have anything you had to add with it? I know that it's really a, a great service that you do by offering that box for us to drop things off. Um, it's good to know. The only way you have is sometimes it gets full. And right. It takes time to be able to unload. There's only certain people from the department that are able to actually access that container, which is me. <laughs> Yeah, but you guys are you guys are real quick about that. I know that last year in the fall when we had the weekend give back, I brought some things because we had the uh, we had recalls on the Pepsid, the generic famotidine that was out there, and it was full. And I told you guys, and the next morning it was empty. So you guys are great about that. Bill, do you have anything? Yeah, the only thing to add uh, was we have um, one of the frequently asked questions we get when people come in are um, we want to. is a good spot. They just have to be um, empty or they are not loaded is what they refer to them as and they'll take the uh, things like the shop or syringes or epipens or um, right. uh, the diabetes. So to, to the full shop containers, once yes. the containers yep. become full, yep. they'll take those as well. Yep. I have been in touch with the VNA because um, I am able, to, where they can't always take, like you said, the full medications yep. if they're unused, obviously, just the preloaded um, syringes. I can take those at the health department. We have the, just a small. Oh, you do. <coughs> oh, that's good. For those that I can, um, we're just working on getting a contract through the town, basically, so that I can then, you know, dispose right. of more of the sharks, the larger containers. I just don't have receptacles to take the sharks containers, but I can take the individual pre-filled syringes that the BNA is not able to take. So we're just kind of trying to fill in the gaps a little bit for options of right. proper disposal. We, we used to be able to have the Board of Pharmacy meet us at a place to destroy medication, but they're not allowed to do that anymore either. Um, but right. I was going to say, following up on that, if you did have some uh, Humalog pens that you weren't using anymore, you could fire all the insulin into your sink and then take that. You said, Tricia, that you, that you give out, yep. the Board of Health will give out those. They're free of charge there. If you come to me, you have to buy them. I do have them, but you know we are a business, so you can buy them. And you can get real big ones. The ones I use for my vaccine clinics uh, are huge. Um, and I think that in for BDs, I think you also have uh, a way to call them, and they will have a pickup for you. And then there's also a five dollar off to buy a new one. I think in those containers. So. By way of a grant, basically, that uh, federal grant that um, allows us to buy a lot of the sharks containers. So. Yes, ma'am. Is there anything other than the thyroid that should be taken on an empty stomach? There, there are medications that you should take on an empty stomach. If you're taking ampicillin, that's an older time antibiotic, but some people still do that. That should be on an empty stomach. Um, you should take, uh, you should take. Cipro and Levaquin, those are uh, nine quinolone drugs that are an antibiotics used for urinary tract infections or maybe some skin infections. Those don't have to be on a totally empty stomach, but they have to be separated from dairy products. Certain tetracyclines and doxycyclines should be separated from dairy products as well. Um, so there are certain ones, but you can always ask your pharmacist. They can tell you what you have on there. There is actually a good lay person site called drugs.com, and that's it's sponsored by the drug companies, but don't let that fool you. It's not false information. And they can tell you in lay person terms what you want. And if you want something higher, they have a professional tab too that will give you the full prescribing information and everything like that. 
did did you need did you no, want to no, add something? Oh no no that's fine, that's fine. I don't want to leave you out. No, one thing yeah. we were just talking about is another thing that came up was um, a lot of people ask about where they can dispose of other types of medication like uh, creams or liquids. Mm -hmm. And um, unfortunately, our can our bin at the police station is pills only. Mm -hmm. So I know um, that they do do. You had touched upon the semi annual drug take back mm -hmm. days that the DEA does in the spring and in the fall. So we try and tell people that um, to uh, try and bring those all those to to particular dates when uh, when those are done. So the for the, the pills right. and the creams, um, and then the, uh, like we said earlier, that the uh, the, uh, the sharps yeah. can be disposed of either a town hall or at the. Uh, I, I still hold the license in Connecticut to, to practice pharmacy, um, and I'm still practicing, so I will get good at it one day. The, uh, and in Connecticut, you can check with your towns because some towns allow you to mix in coffee grounds and kitty litter with creams, ointments, and liquids and label it in a, in a container like an old coffee can label it with duct tape and say medical on it and they still allow you to t put it in the regular waste. I don't think that's the case for Walpole, so please don't do that here. But, um, but there are some towns that do allow you to do that. That question is something we just looked into. We had reached out to um, even the FDA that where all of our town trash here in Walpole goes to an incinerator, not a landfill. Um, so they have let us know that you can do that if you have liquids and whatnot. Excellent. It's compromised, as you said, coffee grounds is a popular one, kitty litter, things like that. Pork cayenne and, pepper. Yep. Sorry. Um, and as long as it's in some form, oh, cayenne pepper is good too. Right. Well, you don't want people, people to, to right. right? Animals even. Right. One of the well, cayenne peppers. Yeah. <laughs> my my neighbor in Farmington used to spray. We're going to bird walk a second. My neighbor in Farmington used to spray tomato plants with cayenne pepper, and the squirrels wouldn't touch them. So. Right. The trash collectors will take it, um, get sent right to an incinerator. Oh, that's excellent to know. That's perfect. That's a really a, a good way to do that. Yes, ma'am. Also, when you're taking vitamin supplements, B3 and mm -hmm. multivitamins and B12, just how do you, you know, space them out or do you need to space them out? That's a really good question, and I'm glad you brought that up. I, I believe in vitamins. They're, RDA, which is the recommended daily allowance that's set for our vitamins from the Food and Drug Administration, there's two schools of thought. The first school is that's all you need, never mind, period, amen. I don't believe in that thought. I believe that the RDA was enough to keep us out of disease. So the RDA for vitamin C is enough to keep us out of scurvy. And the RDA for vitamin B1 is enough to keep us out of rickets. So I take thousands of times the RDA myself personally because I believe in vitamins. Vitamin D, you mentioned, I think everybody in New England has to take an extra vitamin D supplement. About two and a half years ago, they figured out that the sun isn't strong enough to convert our vitamin D into what our body needs, except for uh, June, July, August, a little bit of May, a little bit of September. So check with your doctor first, of course, to see what the supplementations are. 1,000, 2,000 units is normal for somebody to take every day. That's important to take. B and C vitamins, it doesn't matter. They don't really interact with things. Actually, some of the meds you take, and you should check with your pharmacist, might actually be absorbed a little better if you take uh, vitamin C, make your GI tract a little more acidic, such as iron supplements absorb better with vitamin C. But those are water-soluble vitamins, so you can't overdose on those. Um, I like to use the analogy that if you're building a house and you live right next to Home Depot, when you need one two by eight plank, you're gonna walk across the street and buy one two by eight plank. If you live seven miles away, you're gonna wait till you have a list of 12 or 14 items before you go to Home Depot. So your house isn't gonna get built a little longer. But if you're taking extra vitamin Bs and Cs in your system, and even A, D, E, and K that are in the multiple vitamins, and your body needs it to do something, it'll say, oh wait, it's going by in the bloodstream. I'm gonna grab that and I'm gonna use it right now to build the amino acid I need or to build the protein that I'm looking for. Um, and that way your body will work more efficiently. So let's get somebody up here so we can talk about their individual meds unless there's more questions. I can't dance or sing, so we won't do that. Come on up, you'll be first. And because you're first, you get the only blue pen I have. Oh, I have two blue pens. You get one of them. 
So do you, is this how you always use yeah, that's them? A, that's about two or three years. You don't, but do you, do you have a, uh, a pill counter to put them in? Yeah. A big, big one, so you put them all in your big one? Yeah. Okay, good, because I do too. And actually, I was telling Trish that this is what I do for a living. And every night, oh, you have that from us. That's awesome. I love it when a plan comes together on a Thursday afternoon. Good. That's perfect. You, everybody should. What's your name, sir? Bill McAdams. Bill, I'm Eddie. Nice to meet you. Like Bill has, everybody should take at least one of these home and put it in their wallet with their medications on it. It's really important, guys, right, if we have an issue. Um, to, I have one in my wallet. And I know all the medications this I take. Tells, I can draw the structures. Me, this tells me my doctor, too. That's a perfect idea. Perfect idea. So what questions do you have, Bill? I don't know a way to get rid of them. These are, these are no good? No good. They're all no okay. Good. okay. These are ones you have to take home yeah. Yeah. Okay. because they're creams. But these yep. ones, they can take for us. I can us. take those, yep. Yeah. All pills. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Do you have any questions about when you should no, take I, your medication? You're good? Yeah, easy. They put on you the morning or mm -hmm. the afternoon. So you're our, you're our star then. Star of the day. Yes. Good. Here, so you get an extra pill box okay. just because you're the star. First one. Thank you, Bill. Does anybody else? Yes, ma'am. If you have one acting pill. Yes. Is mm -hmm. there any real reason to do that? It depends, uh, yes. Um, I could draw you a graph if I had a nice graph thing. It has to do with how we absorb and, and how our body removes it. Uh, there's a term called a half-life, and half-life is defined by the amount of time it takes our body to remove one half of the dose that we had. Some people's bodies work different than others. So normally, if you're taking a long-acting pill, it releases slowly to the day. It makes a peak, and it really, it, is eliminated slowly, but that may not be helping you because at the end of your 24-hour period, which is, you know, 23, 22, 21 hours later, which is normally in the middle of the morning, you may not have full coverage. So if you're taking something like metoprolol for your heart, most heart, uh, did I hit it on the head? I did yeah. two things right today. That's awesome. Um, if you're taking, originally it was once a day, and then they changed. Were you having, were you having issues in the morning? Here's what happens first thing in the morning if, and, and these guys who have to respond to the 911 calls can, can vouch for that. Many of the heart attacks that happen, happen between two in the morning and six in the morning. And it's because our bodies are used to our circadian rhythm. We're used to getting up, so we're starting to fire up. It's like our engines of, like say we had a spaceship. It takes us a while to warm up our engines. You know, they don't blast the guy off to the moon right away. So our bodies are warming up, and at that time, if we have no drug coverage and it's a little bit harder, that's when we have our myocardial infarctions or heart attacks. So yes, there is a reason for that. Your doctor knows you best. I wouldn't, I wouldn't mess with what they said. Metoprolol, as long acting, can be broken, so that's important. Some drugs can't. Some of the, like if you're taking Procardia, which is a calcium channel blocker, that the way that that one has a long-acting release, it has micro hole drilled through it. So if you cut it in half, you're destroying the reservoir. So you can't do that one. But check with your pharmacist to make sure. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Sometimes I'm pumping in two or three times. Yeah. Is that going to help me with calcium? That's right. I use Tums as my calcium supplement. I use Tums as my calcium supplement. Calcium, at, at the age of 35, human beings break down more bone than they build. So osteoporosis is an issue as we get older. And I take Tums, because it's calcium carbonate, as my calcium supplement several times during the day. I was worried that I, did I, could I overtake, could I overbuild that calcium? Uh, the answer is yes, but you'd have to take a bottle a day. You might, get, you might get renal kidney stones, but that's the only issue you have, but you'd have to take a lot of it. Okay. 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 Yes, ma'am. Is it okay to store your omega-3s in the refrigerator? You can. I, I don't, I, unless your house is at 90 degrees, I don't see why you would want to do that. No, because my husband has it in the refrigerator. It's so, you know what, there's gel inside yeah, the capsule. Exactly. So, most people think that gels have to be stored in a refrigerator, so that's okay. But they don't 
but they don't have to be. And, and the problem with that is in the summertime. If you have a very high di disparity in your, temp your refrigerator temperature is normally between 41 and 45 degrees. So if you have it in the refrigerator and you take it out to take it and you don't take it right away, it can sweat and some of that uh, fish oil that's inside can leak out. So you really don't want to do that. Who's next? Mrs. Golden, come on up. Take yourself a pen and one of these. How are you? I am great. That's good. So are these Thank disposables? You. Yes. I, I these are so. ones that, these ones she can get rid of, their tablets. Yeah, yeah. Did I fill them? Yes, you did. Any more to yes. I don't go any <laughs> I only go to you. I know you do. <laughs> Yeah, the aspirin is a different thing. We can bird walk a little bit about that. They used to say that aspirin, these are all liquids, so those are yours. No, you, you, they can't, she can't take those because they're liquids and creams. You can pour that out in the... Just pour them out, pour them out in coffee grounds or kitty lid or something like that. All right. It's sealed container and it can go right out in your... And it goes in a dumpster. That doesn't it's matter. It's It'll, okay. yep, once they right. up, um, it goes right to an incinerator. Right. Okay. Thank and you. we can talk a little bit about aspirin. Um, they used to always say that you should take a, a, a low-dose aspirin. I took one for 30 years because we have really bad hearts in our family. But the latest data out there, first of all, they said everybody, men and women, should take it. Uh, women, the benefits weren't, um, weren't commensurate with the risks. So they, they said about eight years ago, women don't really need to take one unless your doctor recommends you. I don't want to change anything your doctor tells you to do. You should listen to him above me. Um, uh, but then with men, they said that there's a higher chance of cranial bleeds composed to protecting our hearts. And I think that also has to do with maybe our population is becoming more healthy. Um, you know, everybody's exercising now. If you come to my talk in April, uh, then 27th, we're going to talk about is there a spring in your step or your walk or your run, why we need exercise as we age. Who's next? Hi, Marsha. You have a prescription to pick up. Yes. Just getting rid of? Yes. Perfect. Old ones. We'll take care of that. Yes. My friend Marilyn is on pantoprazole. Mm -hmm. Prior to eating? You told me I could do 20 minutes. It's normally 20 to 30 minutes. It's going to start. It, it's peak time. The peak time for it to be totally involved in our bloodstream is 45 minutes. But our bodies start to react quicker than that. So 20 to 45 minutes is all the same. What they're doing is, I don't know how severe, and everybody's different again, I don't know how severe her GERD is when she eats. So if it's really severe, the doctor's probably telling her to make sure she gets it in 45 minutes before so it's at its peak optimum therapeutic level. So Maybe it can do that. She said she's getting 40. We're both on 40, mm -hmm. um, but she has to take hers twice a day. Some people do do that. Some omeprazole comes 10, 20, and 40 milligrams. Some people take it once a day. Some people take 40 milligrams twice a day. It's just how we're built. Um, you know, it also has to do with everybody for years as we develop drugs, as companies develop drugs. I didn't do that because I wouldn't be here if I did. Uh, but anyway, if we, as, as they develop drugs, we thought it's cause and effect. You plug a lamp in and the light goes on. But they're thinking now that that really doesn't happen because a drug that they find is, that is really, really good only has a positive therapeutic response in 45 to 75 percent of the people. And that's a really good drug. So what happens to those 25 to 55 percent of the people? Why isn't it working with them? We just don't know yet. It's probably a mechanism of action that we haven't figured out yet. And everybody says, oh yeah, Eddie, you're dreaming, you're dreaming. But I used to read Isaac Asimov when I was in high school, and he talked about making a phone call with your watch. And that was silly, right? But you can do that now. He talked about computers that can think for themselves. Have you heard of Watson? He won on Jeopardy. So, you know, there are things, cars can drive themselves now, which was ludicrous in the, in the 50s and the 40s. So, Right, you can have telephone video chats, right. So there may be something to go with that. 
Your doctor always knows best. Let me reiterate that until I'm green in the face. Your doctor always knows best about you because they do that. And I will tell you this, too, about your doctors. In, in the average course of a doctor's professional life, they prescribe between 40 and 60 medications. On those 40 or 60 medications, I would bet my house that he knows more about how those drugs act in a population than I do. From all the research I've had, from all the schooling I've had, and I do a lot of continuing education every year. We have to do 20 hours every year in Massachusetts. I do over 40 because I believe in education. But because he has worked with those drugs over the course of 40 years, he knows, he or she, knows what that drug is going to do for their patients that are 40 years old in a certain demographic. So listen to what your doctor says for you. They know you best. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, the uh, acid inhibitors that are on the market today, there's a lot of bad press uh, regarding that. Can you tell me what the best one is to take and for how long? Okay, so as we just said, I don't know what the best one for you personally is, because one may work for you and one may not. Are you talking about something that stops the, the acid from being produced? Or are you talking about something that changes how our bodies react to what we eat? Um, the ones that are over the market, the H2 blockers, which are your Pepsid or Famotidine, Tagamet, which is Cimetidine, Zantac, which is Renitidine, those guys, what they are is their H2 blockers. So what they do is, uh, and I'm just going to use numbers as an example, if we ate a meal, we had a nice steak and potato and asparagus meal, <laughs> our body may release, release 12 units of acid to break that down so that we can use those components to turn into energy to build the building blocks of our body. If you take a ranitidine, let's say, maybe your body only allows you to release 8 units. So you're, you're releasing less acid to do the job it was meant to do. Is that good or bad or indifferent? If it's stopping you from having indigestion, it's probably a good thing. Would you, should you eat a little bit of a smaller meal? Probably. Should we all eat a little bit of a smaller meal? I, yeah, I don't know. When I go to a steak restaurant, if they gave me an 8-ounce steak, I eat the 8-ounce steak. If they gave me a 12-ounce steak, I'd eat the 12-ounce steak. So it's all the same. The other ones, the Prilosec, which is now over the counter, the uh, Prevacid, which is over the counter, or Asifex, or protonics, which are still behind the counter by prescription, they stop the acid from being produced. They're called proton pump inhibitors. They stop the acid from being produced. So you may only have three units of acid to release at any one time. So that's the difference. So which is best for you? The answer is what works best for you. Do you have to try them? Yeah, you do. Anybody who's taken um, levothyroxine or Synthroid knows that they make 12 different strengths because you have to take it for a little while to see how you feel. Are you too hyper? Are you too sleepy? And they adjust it that way. So you would have to try to see which one works better for you. How long can you take them was the other second half of your question. For the, for the uh, ones that are the ranitidine, the H2 blockers, there's no issues that say you shouldn't. The, other ones have been on the market now for over 15 years. So originally, when the studies were done, and, and most of this has to do with because we have a lot of lawyers in our country, the studies that were done originally said that those drugs should only be taken for two six-week six -week periods in a 52-week span. So what they're saying is, According to the manufacturers, all the studies they've done only studied people taking it for 12 weeks out of 52. So did they do studies on people who are over the age of 65? They did not. So now when everybody's on Medicare Part D, Medicare Part D doesn't want to get sued from somebody getting sick from taking one of those all the time. So they say, no, you shouldn't take it all the time. I've been taking omeprazole every day in the morning, first thing in the morning every day because I wasn't allowed to eat spaghetti sauce after a while, which is really sad if you're Italian, uh, on Sunday afternoons. So I've been taking it, and the only issue with omeprazole, there was some bad press about causing some dementia, but that was in a small study in Sweden. I didn't give it too much thought when I read the study. I wasn't real convinced. Uh, it does leak out magnesium, so you should take a magnesium supplement. So 250 milligrams of magnesium sulfate is certainly a perfect dose to take every day, but I've been taking it for over eight years and, and I haven't grown any extra body parts or I haven't forgotten my name. I do forget my wife's name every now and then, but I think that's on purpose. So, you take the or something like that. Yeah. Is it still okay to take 
Yes, it is. It is. I wouldn't take them exactly at the same time because you don't need the double kill. Um, as I said before, everybody should be taking a calcium supplement. Normally for women over the age of 40, they recommend between 1,200 and 1,800 milligrams. You should take calcium multiple times during the day. You get better absorption that way. I use Tums. My wife takes calcium tablets. She likes the white ones that slide down easy. But I take Tums because it's calcium carbonate. Yes, ma'am. You say anything about Flonase and a Fugural? Okay, those are totally different. Flonase oh, is total. Flonase is a steroid drug that's used topically in our nose. So you certainly can use that for sinus congestion issues that are topical. So when you're using it, and I don't know if the doctor told you or the pharmacist recommended, whenever you use a nose spray, you should use opposite hand. So if you're using, if you're spraying into your left nostril, you should use your right hand. You see how my hand is tilted? Our sinus cavities are split down the middle of our head. So if I went like this, it just goes up and down the back of my throat. It works a little bit, but not a lot. So if I use opposite hand, I'm spraying it to where my sinus cavities are. You can use that with albuterol. Albuterol is a short-acting bronchodilator that you use by mouth, normally used for asthma people. If you're using that in conjunction with a steroid inhaler or a different inhaler, one of the other long-acting bronchodilators, you should use the albuterol first. Are you okay? I'm just going to get some more. Okay. I have drugs that'll fix that. No, I'm just kidding. <coughs> just kidding. I don't want to make you laugh anymore. That was really bad, right? I shouldn't have done that. Anyway, um, the albuterol is fast acting, but the um, American Society of Pulmonologists and Asthma say that you really shouldn't use more than one albuterol in a month. If you, because there are drugs out there that can control your asthma, that can control your COPD, that can control your emphysema. So you should not be relying on that. Now, during this time when <coughs> allergies are happening and, and um, and we're getting pollen in the air. Do you maybe need it? Yes, you do. The best practice is if you're using two inhalers, it's going to take you seven to eight minutes to do your inhalers. Now, I know that's ridiculous, right? But that's best practice. You do the first puff of your albuterol, you wait two minutes, do the second puff of your albuterol, and as you know, you shake it up, you breathe your air out, you start to breathe in, spritz it into your mouth, Slow, controlled, deep breath. Try to hold it for 10 seconds and then exhale your air. And then you wait three or four minutes and then do your other steroid inhaler. I'm commandeering all the time, guys. Do you guys have anything? <laughs> yes, ma'am. I guess as a retired <coughs> nurse, what I have to say after hearing this presentation is that a lot of our medical people and I don't know how I can delicately say this. And don't. As grow older, the medications change, and it gets harder to integrate medications with elderly people. But I do think that the medical <coughs> physicians and the practices, they're not instructing patients correctly on how to take their medicine. I, I don't think it's because they don't want to. I agree with you. I think it's because there are time constraints. And th there are a lot of other things. As we get age, as we age and get older, things don't work like they used to. Uh, our bodies don't absorb things like we used to. Our GI tract doesn't work as efficiently as we used to. Um, I, I, I've only been golfing for 10 years, but 10 years ago I hit the ball 10 yards farther with each of my clubs. So we, and I go to the gym pretty much every day. So we do as we age, we're not as efficient as we once were. I don't think it has to do with the medical professionals that they don't want to, but because of, because of healthcare costs that there's more paperwork for them to do and they get paid. So they have to see so many people in an hour. And I've had many people in Connecticut where I'm from that there was a couple of nurse practitioners that wanted and needed to spend time with their patients and they were let go from the practice because they were taking too long being a human being and, and that's sad you're absolutely correct so my answer to that is come talk to us well, pharmacists pharmacists number one are the most trusted profession I'm not saying it just because of me I think I was seventh so they um, pharmacists are the most trusted profession but we're also the most readily available 
You know, many pharmacies have, you know, your CVS is out there, and, and CVS did a great job of promoting pharmacy in the 80s. Um, they want you to shop in the store, so it takes them a little longer to fill a prescription. That's by design from their bosses, but that's okay. Their pharmacists are good pharmacists. They all have to go to the same schools we all have to go to. Um, and they're the most readily accessible resource, so use us. That's what we're here for. You have a bag there. Did you need to see me? Well, let me just say I'm um, not very good about getting rid of things, but I recently retired, and I you know, try to clean up a lot of stuff, but I don't want to take the rest of the time here. Because there's a lot. Maybe Bring it up. That's what we're here for. Come on. Why? You just want to get rid of them, right? Or do you have questions about them? Um, because we can do both. I put little tags on some. Okay, sure. I, I brought these chairs for no reason. I stand all day anyway. Okay. Never took does it work. Biotin is a B vitamin. It helps with our it helps with our uh, body to build healthy red blood cells and helps with our energy level. Does it work? Sure. It does work. Well, Do you need it? I don't know. Um, Do you run I the marathon? I bought it because my brother said it helps you, uh, keeps you from losing so much hair. <laughs> um, well, part of there, there is a vitamin. You can grow more. Or? There is a. <laughs> well, that. <laughs> there's an old joke about that. You know, when Rogaine first. When Rogaine first came on the market, they, Rogaine is a drug that's called minoxidil. It was actually built as a, um, as a drug for blood pressure. It did okay for blood pressure, but had some side effects. But it found one of the side effects was that it grew hair. So the old joke was that when you put it on, you also grew hair in your palm. <laughs> but anyway, so bi biotin is part of what they call a hair, nails, yeah. compilation of of drugs that they have, which has gelatin in it, has some B vitamins in it, has vitamin A and D. Those are antioxidants that help our bodies to remove free radicals, which happen as we age. Um, but so sure, it does work. But if you're not taking it and you don't think you should take it, then there's no need for you to have it. Right. Is but it expired? Yeah. Yeah, I bought it because he said, you know. Sure. Mm -hmm. it, went, it, it was good up until Halloween, so you could have given it out to the kids. <laughs> Just kidding. Is that? This is, um, this is a muscle relaxant. Do oh, you take this? Oh, that's the one I have to be sure to take back. There you go. Yeah. So you don't want to take that when you're going to use a forklift in the living room because it could make you drowsy. No, the forklift is only a kitchen utensil. Um, so just make sure that you're not going to go out driving or, or mowing the lawn or whatever when you take that. Right. I, I had torticollis. Twice. And mm -hmm. That's I keep keep it on hand in case, but luckily it hasn't happened. Again. There you go. Dante is thirteen now, and this <laughs> expired when he was twelve. Well, some of them are like that. You don't need that. That's Tylenol. They're cheap. You can buy. It. But I, I'm glad you bought it from me. I appreciate that. Um, I, I don't know if you want to. To, to, to use this. They use turmeric for several different things. It helps with your cholesterol, helps with uh, anti-inflammatory and arthritis, they say. Yeah, um, that's, that's why. But again, Dante was 13 when that one went out. <laughs> Dante is my oldest grandson. I told you I wasn't good about cleaning this things is, out. This is for a cough. Um, what did I write on the top there? This is for a cough. Uh, we're, we're over the cold season now, so you're probably not going to need it anymore. Um, the, this medication, I don't know if anybody else has taken, I probably shouldn't tell what that is, because then that spreads it out to everybody. Um, but anyway, this is for a cough, so uh, I, you can I don't take have a it. Cough. I don't know what the date is on it. <laughs> That's okay. This was an antibiotic, but this is for when you go to the dentist. Okay, is there something left in there? There is, but it expired a whole year ago. Yeah, so I have an, uh, an up-to-date one, one and, okay. and I didn't have to use that. They so can't take back liquids. I, I never even opened that one. You know what? These don't have any preservative in there, 
but they're micro sealed. So chance, we have to put an expiration date on everything by the FDA. There's an expiration date on iron tablets. Iron is an element. <laughs> it's around forever. So does it really expire? No, it doesn't. But they have to put an expiration date by law. So this has an expiration date on it, but if you want to use these for your eyes to help keep them moist, don't reuse them. Some people open the top of it, use half of it, and then wait, and then use the other half. Don't do that. But when you open it, it's still going to be sterile. It's still, I'm sure, good unless it's cloudy. So I don't know if you want to keep those or not, but she can't, Trish can't take those oh, anyway. Okay. Those are persona non grata. This is just an empty bottle. So I'll take oh, that to oh, recycle it. Reason, but do you have a question? Yeah, I, I do take this mm -hmm. one and I have a whole bunch of empty ones but I wasn't sure how to get all this information off to throw it away because it's not easy but one of the ladies was kind enough to say if you put a wet cloth around it for 15 minutes mm -hmm. or so it'll come off. You can also take one of these wonderful little sharpies right, and it will get your name off of there. Right. And that's all you really need to make it non-HIPAA. Okay. But I can take and recycle it if you want. Okay, thank you. Sure. Oh, memory. Excellent. <laughs> I should have taken that one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> hey, I'm supposed to be the comedy guy. You're going to be the straight guy. Uh, ginkgo is absolutely used for that. I do take a supplement that has that. Um, but this is expired. So if you want to do that, you can. I, I take from the herbal world, I believe in the herbal world. So ginkgo is good for our memory. Uh, hesperidin root is good for a positive mood affect. Um, green tea extract is good for our digestion, helps our joints a little bit. And um, ginseng is energy. So I do take those four in a compilation of a multiple vitamin with other real vitamins, AD. By definition, the word vitamin means something that the human body needs that it cannot make itself. So you have to get it from food source or a supplement. So I do believe in them. So you can do that if you want after the fact. Oh, there's probably a bunch here that I, I buy to keep on hand, but then they, you know. Right, they expire. I, I'm not a pill taker, so they, they right. go buy and then and I you had the sale them. that was buy one, get three free, and then you don't <laughs> use the other two. Right? That does, that certainly does happen. Um, you'll laugh at this if you, we want to bird walk just another second. My, uh, when I owned my pharmacy, my wife had a headache and we had nothing in the house that really? <laughs> could help that. She yelled at me. I said, well, the pharmacy is only a mile away. I'll go down and get you something. But I like sales. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, this was for your dog. Right, and he's been gone a while, so... <laughs> You could have taken it. It's a human drug, but I don't think oh, you really? need it. No, it's for I your heart. No, no thought about that. This is the chondroitin and glucosamine. Chondroitin and glucosamine is actually really good for arthritis if you have osteoarthritis. The studies that were done show that 70% of the people who have osteoarthritis do respond positively to glucosamine and chondroitin. Now, osteoarthritis destroys our uh, ligaments and our tendons and our joints, in our joints. Um, chondroitin and glucosamine make up that matrix. But you have to take it for at least 28 days in a row to know if you're having any positive effect. That being said, the same guy that used to spray his tomatoes was an orthopedic surgeon who lived next to me. And he was a, a college athlete. He played baseball. And he took it preventatively. Does it help him? I don't know. He said, yeah, I guess. So it, it doesn't matter. I tried that because I broke an ankle many, many years ago, never had it fixed, so it bothers me now while I'm trying to walk the golf course, and it didn't help me because it's not osteoarthritis. Okay, but you I, don't need that I either. I took, took it for a long well, time, but I never empty. thought it did that Here, much. we'll put this in here so nobody sees you. Okay, well, this stuff you may not want to walk with. Well, they can't, well, they can't take powders. But you can, you can take and mix that with water and coffee grounds if you drink coffee or kitty litter and put that in, as Trish said, right in the trash and it'll get destroyed. This liquid is the same thing too. I, I mean, it does have an expiration date. Is it really going to help stop the itching? Probably, if you get poison ivy. <laughs> yeah, this one you want to destroy too. You, uh, this was for a cough. Right. When did you get this? Yeah, it was filled uh, a year, almost two years ago, actually over two years ago. So, yeah, so you should, I obviously didn't need a lot right, of it. Right, so you can mix that with a kitty litter in the coffee greens. 
coffee grounds. Yeah, I don't drink coffee. Those are all sample things that you can get rid of. I don't, oh, this is just a spray for, uh, as an odor eliminator, you don't need that. So it's okay to spray it down the sink or sure, in the sure. toilet? Sure, absolutely. I, I never know. Absolutely, you okay. can open this and just pour this out. This I, is just salt I water. I thought I could. With yeah, anything, it's just salt water. Sure. Not a problem. And then these are, these are laxative. I don't know if he had to buy these if he had a colonoscopy or something. That might have been the case. Probably. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've and then if he had diarrhea. But these are expired, so right. we don't need those. Well, you did have the most. You win. Here. Take one. <laughs> You get to put your medications on. I already gave you the blue pen. I'll give her a red one so you don't get jealous. Oh, thank you very thank much. You. I appreciate it. Thank you. That, that helps the cause considerably. There you go. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Can we set up our For what? Sure. You know, actually, if you have Medicare Part D, you're, you, ha you can do a full medication, a full medication record, but it goes to the pharmacy you fill your prescriptions at. Pharmacists actually are now getting paid for that from Medicare Part D to do that, and, and I, I do do them. They are actually remodeling part of our store. They, uh, the little Y closed. They closed all the little Ys last June, um, and they are giving me room to put in consultation rooms to do that. So you can, but you have to get your prescriptions from me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Am I not am I not preferred on well care now? I don't know. You can call them on the back of your insurance card and, and you can all do that for any pharmacy you want to go to. I'm not here to plug my pharmacy. Come to Big Y. I'm not here to plug our pharmacy. But if um, you can call the back of your card, has a customer service number, and you can ask them, you give them their zip code and ask them what pharmacies are preferred for you. Yes, there is a difference in that. Do I think it's illegal? Absolutely. They shouldn't allow that. This is America. We should be able to choose to go where we want to go to. And, and that, unfortunately, is the way it is. But you can call them and ask them. If I'm preferred, you won't pay any more from me than you would anywhere else. But well care is a different animal because well care is part of all of those buyouts that they had. Well care was bought by Aetna and Aetna was owned by CVS, but then CVS sold parts of it all off. CVS, just so that you guys know, the biggest processor of prescriptions is an intermediate processor. We send it to them, they pay us, then they collect the money from the people who buy the insurance. CVS Caremark is the largest in the country. It's owned by CVS. Express Scripts is the third lar is second largest in the country. That's owned by Walgreens. The third largest is Aetna, which used to be owned by CVS. And they still have their fingers in there somewhere, but I, I'm not sure exactly where it is. But you certainly can call. Yes, ma'am. Uh, related to what I asked before, what do you, does an extender do any good? Sure. If you're not, if you're for inhalers, you're yeah. talking, right? If you're not, if you're not breathing in all the dose that you're supposed to be getting because of your technique, and it's not that you're bad, it's just that sometimes they're more complicated than other times, then a spacer will help you. The newer ones, you don't need a spacer because most of the newer inhalers that are out there are all breath activated. So you do have to have a strong enough intake of air to be able to activate the medication from being released into your lungs. But yes, a spacer will work because what it does is you spray it in the spacer and it stays in that confined space. Then you open your mouthpiece and breathe it in and you're getting all of that medication that was there. Now, spacers are expensive. Many insurance plans don't pay for them and they run between $40 and $59. You can use the inner tube to your toilet paper as a spacer. No, I was given one in the hospital at That's one good. time. Right. Yeah. It's, it sure, it probably will be good. I recommend, though, that if you're using it regularly and you're using multiple inhalers, that you rinse it out with a vinegar water solution to make sure you're not growing anything in there. The thing that you grow in there when you don't have, when it's not real wet and it's not real hot is you grow fungus, and we don't really like that in our lungs. It doesn't do well with human lungs. And do you know anything about the state medical, okay, state employees, insurance about them 
what they cover for medication. I do not, but again, you can get that on the, you can either get it on the website if you have a computer, or you can get that by calling them and tell them what your coverage is. You can also ask them to send you a printed form of what it is. The retiree plans are all now being taken over by the Medicare Part D, and that's because since Obamacare was instituted, all insurance goes through the federal government first. So the people who you used to work for are saying, well, why should I pay 100% of that when 50% of it is covered by the federal government? Now, the plan that you have may not cover what your contract was when you retired, but they make up the difference for that. So your contract doesn't change, but it goes through Medicare Part D first. So, but you can call them on the back and they should be able to help you with that. Are we, I think we're out of time. Thank you very much all, thank you Trish. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being here. Um, I really do appreciate all you guys do every day. Um, it, it's not a, I mean, it's a job I wanted when I got out of high school, but I don't think it's a job I could do. You guys do a great job. Trish, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you guys. Thank you.